I would never sort of imagine sort of them guys coming out here for such a long time and trying to live an African life. Um, I don't know how they manage it. I've never heard of anybody moving to Kenya at such an early age and especially the developmental years. It's one of those things that, yeah, a lot of people have thought about, but nobody has the balls to do it. My name is Zane Robertson. I'm from New Zealand. I'm the current Oceana record holder for 10,000 on the road and half marathon. I'm also a Rio Olympics 10,000 meter 12th place finalist and I've been a world champs finalist two times before. And you're here listening to the physical performance show. And the is Failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. <laughs> Absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, Let's go. Welcome back or welcome to the Physical Performance Show brought to you by the Gold Coast Marathon and Pogo Physio. I'm Brad Beer, sports physiotherapist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. As per the intro, the aim of this show is to educate and inspire you towards the pursuit of your own physical best performance. We do this through interviews featuring some of the world's top physical performers and also some of the world's preeminent experts in their chosen fields. Each week, we'll aim to bring you the highs, the lows and the learnings of the featured guests. And this week, you are in for a real treat. This week's featured performer is Zane Robertson. I had the distinct pleasure of getting to know Zane Robinson really well recently ahead of his debut marathon performance at home here on the Gold Coast competing in the 2019 Gold Coast Marathon. And what a marathon debut it was for Zane Robinson, New Zealand star distance runner. Zane Robinson debuted with an impressive 208.19, which is an average of 302 per kilometre to set a new New Zealand marathon record. Zane took third place in the 2019 edition of the Gold Coast Marathon, and this added to his record list. Zane's other records by way of bio include the Oceanic record for the half marathon running a swift 59.47, the 10k road Oceanic record of 27.28. Zane has also been a dual world championships finalist, a 2016 Rio Olympic 10,000 meter track finalist, and Zane was also the 2014 Commonwealth Games bronze medalist in the 5,000 meters at Glasgow. But what makes Zane Robertson's success so unique is not just his remarkable results, but it's a story that underpins how Zane Robertson has achieved what he has. Zane and his identical twin brother, Jake, as just 17-year-olds, laid it all on the line by moving to East Africa, Kenya, 13 years ago in order to become the best runners they possibly could. They moved to East Africa to train with the best distance runners in the planet. And you heard at the top of the show from double-double Olympic Games champion Mo Farah and others about this intriguing tale of pursuing one's physical best. This really is a story of the highs, the lows and the learnings. And on today's episode, you'll hear Zane share around some of the hardships that he endured as a junior runner. The bullying at school growing up, classmates and also even teachers the studying that he and Jake did to learn and understand what it would take to be a world-class runner, the pressures of being an unsponsored athlete, including at the time of recording, the heartache that comes with injury, including two sacral stress fractures that cost Zane a 2018 marathon debut in the Commonwealth Games, the emotions and feelings that Zane was experiencing in the lead-up to his marathon debut at the Gold Coast Marathon, the training insights of the Kenyans and the Ethiopians, strength and conditioning principles, the importance of training tendons, and Zane lays down a physical challenge to us for the week. At the time of recording, Zane now calls Ethiopia home, having married Beza, his Ethiopian sweetheart, 
And this is a little insight into the world of Zane Robertson, New Zealand distance running star. Here is my conversation with Zane. This is an episode I have been looking forward to recording for some time with great anticipation. Zane Robertson, it is fantastic to have you here on the Gold Coast for your marathon debut and taking time out of your pre-race schedule to feature on the Physical Performance Show. So welcome and thank you. Uh, Thanks for having me, Brad. Um, First off for the treatment, um, you know, just touched down last night, um, slept about four hours and was out the door this morning. So... uh, Today's the perfect day to get on the show. And Zane, uh, you've flown in for this, the Gold Coast Marathon, which is the much anticipated marathon debut for your career. Uh, To build back up to that point, let's go backwards first. And so how did Zane Robertson first discover the talent that the world has now seen you express through your running? I think... Um, It it happened in early days, kindergarten and primary school, both me and my brother Jake. We were in kindergarten, we always used to have races out the back in the the grass area and Jake and I were both the fastest by far. Moving on to primary school, um, our mother bought us the Roman sandals because uh, it was something that she did back in her day, but um, it actually stopped us from running fast. So we were finishing last in, in the races, and I kind of became scared of the prickles. And one day I just said, ah, screw this. I took my um, sandals off and I ran, and I won the race by far, and Jake was last. And I said, Jake, if you run fast enough, you don't feel the prickles. <laughs> so um, he... He took his sandals off the next time and we just smashed everyone. So from there, it was, it was clear talent was, um, talent was available. We both had it. And um, moving on to later on where, you know, people start to mature a little bit earlier and through puberty, intermediate school, um, the first year we, we both won uh, our intermediate school race, but going on to the uh, into into schools we actually got beaten quite badly and that was the first time we both didn't like it so the next year we trained a little bit and came back and um, I won by over 400 metres and smashed everyone and I was like oh, okay so it's, it's work on talent that, that counts, you can't just be talented and, uh, and hope that you'll, you'll finish somewhere so work on talent that counts and I mean there's so much in there so your mother bought you the sandals was that just like okay boys I've got to put something on your feet get out the door and go and do this but it sounds like at that point no one really knew what was about to happen with you know the talent that was there I uh, even um at the point of the intermediate school when we were both beaten in the first year, um, you know, our mother was a little bit like, uh, okay, it's time, it's time, boys, now to focus on school. Um, no more of this running stuff. And, you know, anyone who ever challenged us, um, you know, defeat, or if it was a person or a teacher or someone, it always made us want to work harder. We did the opposite. And I think that's what uh, a lot of people let discourage them, you know, people telling them you can't do something. Um, Jake and I just used it as anger, and um, we used anger as motivation. And uh, it's not uncommon to hear young athletes say that, you know, they were driven to show someone that their assessment of them was incorrect and, uh, you know, to to prove them wrong. Uh, Does anger still drive Zane Robertson in 2019? It still does, and... You know, uh, Steve Willis is here with me. Um, he's uh, my advisor now and has been a friend of mine for a few years. But a few years back, he said, like, you know, you guys need to lose that. But um, he came to terms with it. He's like, actually, this is what drives you guys. And um, definitely it still does. You know, the last two years um, since 2016 have been riddled with a lot of injury for me. A lot of people have just writ- written me off. Um, since last year, I've made some moves, and um, 
it's really helped me uh, mentally again to be back at the top level. And I ha- I've recently been telling my wife that I haven't felt this way since 2015 when I ran under 60 for the half. So that's a it's a good sign for the for what will be the weekend ahead. So the anger still drives you in in some ways. Obviously, there's maturity there, which we all go through. Uh, what is it that is it just the anger of having the injuries, or is it? I mean, I, I've followed your journey and your brothers for, for quite a few years since I first came across this fascinating story of Jake and Zane Robertson moving to East Africa as seventeen-year-olds, sort of following every ambitious runner's dream of of living and training in East Africa. And from what I can detect, Zane, there's been some real low points, almost points of rejection, uh, rejection across multiple levels. Uh, is that part of the anger that fuels you? Yeah, definitely. Um, I still even, I, people say don't hold a grudge, but it's not holding a grudge. It's, um, it's holding stuff that you can use. Uh, you know, you, Arnold Schwarzenegger said your struggles build your strength, and I really believe that. Through high school, I had a lot of struggles with um, bullying, um, not just on the kids' level, but teachers. Uh, I had my high school dean tell me, um, you know, tell me in my face, like, I was so driven. Both of us were asked to his office, and he told us, um, what if you don't make it? And then we were both replying to him, um, if I think that way then I won't make it, for sure. And straight away he started yelling at us and telling us, um, you know, you have to have a backup plan and all this. You know, I don't believe that's true. I think if you go for something, you've got to go for it 100%, and um, that's exactly what we did, and uh, we're still proving them wrong to this day, and that still drives me till now. And was the bullying, say, from friends, I mean... Teachers is another level. Yeah, it's, uh, was um, it jealousy is that what it was that you guys I are think, doing I, great things? I think it's uh, a lot of the tall poppy syndrome. You know, Jake and I were very different. We were um, quite lean because our natural ability, also natural talent, to be distance runners. Uh, we didn't look like the typical boys, uh, rugby players or something. The PE teachers started to call our coach, our mother, and tell them that they think we're anorexic. Um, the high school vice principal would come and watch us eat lunch to make sure we're eating stuff like that we would actually see him spying on us through the window and we had to change where we would eat our lunch because we were uncomfortable um, stuff like that but my, we were making our mother broke with how much uh, we were actually eating because we were eating more than these kids we were just uh, burning a lot more calories we were just you know, high metabolism kids and uh, just different. So being different is good. It, it means that in the future you might live more of an interesting life than everyone else. Well, I think uh, there's a lots of layers about the Robertson boys, Zane, yourself here today, that uh, those that follow running I think are intrigued and captivated by. It's, it's, it's such a story and you, definitely unique gentleman. In terms of, Zane, the schoolyard antics... Uh, was there ever a voice that did encourage you? So there was the, the pushback, the bullying, the, the cynicism, but was, it, was there a voice of encouragement where, where someone came along and said, hey, Zane, I want you to focus and put your head down because you really have a, an impressive talent? I think it was our, uh, had to be our first coach um, ever. Uh, it had to be Don Willoughby from the Hamilton City Hawks. And he... He um, took like two wild tamed uh, like two wild animals and tamed them to you know actually learning and starting to learn about training and um, it was about a year before we started going to Africa we started to even reach out on our own branch out study the internet any programs of the greats we could find and find out what's real what's not what we can do and we started pushing those limits trying to train three times a day. And um, finding out that, oh, okay, my body, my body breaks if I do this, uh, you know. So um, we, we were already in the phase of learning before we went to East Africa about what the, what the East Africans do. And um, I, think, I think that helped us adapt when we were there, already there. And where does this, you've used the word, uh, driven numerous times and 
that would be a word that springs to my mind when I think about yourself. Where does that drive come from? We've, you've spent, you know, you've, you've referenced that there's a desire to show that, you know. I think the drive comes from some peaceful place in between negative and positive. It it comes from um, first. Um, I'm looking out for me. I want to do this for me. Secondly, I want to do this for all the people who who love me, who believe in me, who um, who I feel like I owe something to because I've I've given my whole life up for this. And then uh, then of course the negative people in my life, you know, who who always doubted me, and um, we've already been there. Yeah. <laughs> so. I want to prove them wrong, and every step I take, like towards that goal and um, these victories, I feel like uh, I prove them wrong again. And I mean, uh, to give context, you know, you're in between representation as a professional athlete at the moment, correct? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, talking about the going back through the injuries of the last few years, and um, currently I'm unsponsored. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I came to terms with it and I appreciate this moment because it makes me realise, like, um, you know, where I've come from and it's actually made me feel that again. It's made me feel that hunger to prove people wrong. And I, I've been through two stress fractures in my sacrum, a stress fracture in my metatarsal, a stress fracture in... Um, not even a stress fracture, I rolled my ankle and probably the worst injury I've had is rolling my ankle in June 2017 it's just a freak accident in the forest and I heard a pop I was about 15 minutes from the car running and um, I lay on the ground and thought this one is bad um, I got up and ran back to the car 15 minutes I don't know how but um, there was a UK, there was a uh, British physio in Kenya at the time and because I ran back to the car he thought there's no way it could be broken it was swollen up, it was blue um, I drove even back to the house with it and uh, about 10 days or 2 weeks later I was running on it so he thought oh, no problem it's ok, no need to get an MRI or scan um, I trained on it through the world championships I raced the Great North Run on it and ran 61 half. Later on, um, it just in Amsterdam, I uh, just couldn't take it. And um, in December, I got a scan on my foot and they found the injuries that had already healed or in the healing process. It was a crushed fibula, uh, three torn ligaments, and the heel bone had come off partially with it. Um, so... I think running through that injury caused me a lot of problems I've had with, uh, you know, the 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 chain up the line. And um, I think if any runner feels something in their body, they should listen to themselves and go and get it checked. Yeah, I mean, my professional work when I'm not moonlighting in the, this capacity is uh, as a physiotherapist and I always say that the best gift you can give a, a patient, an athlete, a client is an accurate diagnosis so it is so important isn't it Zane, uh, just still painting a bit of a picture of your your world, you moved to East Afri- Africa with your twin brother Jake at 17 years of age, pursuing the dream the dream that every runner I think's ever had, but you guys actually did it you had a return ticket uh, you let that lapse and you stayed put in Kenya, in the hub of, uh, of African running there. And 13 years on, you are now over in Ethiopia. I believe you know you married your beautiful wife, Beza, at yeah. the start of this year. And uh, so that's a long story short. But what was it that has kept you in East Africa for not just half a year or one training camp, but for those 13 years? And. It's definitely a struggle every day to deal with uh, the stresses of, uh, let's say, a third world country and living with corruption all around you. But at the same time, it's a blessing. There's a lot of positive things I get from it. 
Um, a lot of the people are very friendly, very relaxed, so you can also live a very relaxed lifestyle. You don't need to stress about anything. You can just focus every hour of the day on your training, which is either training or recovery, rest or s- sleep or food. There's nothing, nothing more in your day. Uh, whereas overseas, there's a lot of distractions, uh, cafes, people want to go out drinking. There's the whole social drinking theme, and um, I think it's it's very hard to live that lifestyle if you were living somewhere else in the world. And you know, in researching for this today, Zane, I I heard you say that you never hear an African say I can't do it. They just go out there and try. How has that rubbed off on your mindset and approach? Yeah, I mean. At coming into my first marathon, I've never been so nervous, so scared, so excited and so confident at the same time. Um, I haven't done training like this before. Uh, the sessions have all gone amazing, um, faster than I've done before I ran the 59, 47 half. And I feel like I'm in shape to do something here. but. At the same time, it's the first time I've ever done this, so anything can happen. And I believe that it's it's not a failure to try. You, if you do fail and everyone judges you for it, because of course they will. Um, it doesn't matter because I'll come back and I'll try again. And you know, everyone will have their day. And if I had listened to everyone before I ran my first half marathon then I wouldn't have run under 60 because I wouldn't have believed I could. And I was actually asked at the press conference uh, a day before the race, so what do you think you can run? Um, Same question was given to all the runners. One of them was a 58-40 guy, and he said, I can run 59 here, course record. And I said, I think I can run 59 half. They say, oh, you're a 1,500, 5,000 guy. Uh, what gives you such confidence? So, well, my, one of my training partners, who was a nobody, just won Dubai Marathon in 205, um, Haile Lemi Brahanu. And I've been keeping up with him in training and finishing every session with him. So why can't I do the same? Um, if you have to take confidence in what you've done in training what you know your body can do uh, wow and uh and that's that word again you said you're feeling scared nervous and confident yeah. and so confidence you know is a huge huge factor the the fear the, the fear is the fear of what approaching a race like this um i don't want to sound uh cocky but i am confident and i don't want to write off any of the other competitors but I really believe this race and I believe the marathon is more of a battle with yourself. I think it's about surviving the distance with the pace that you set for yourself and I've set a pretty pretty crazy pace for Sunday and um, I just want to really challenge my, my own limits and if I fail, I fail but at least I've tried and I believe that I can do it. And I know that all the Kenyans that are here in the men's elite field will uh, will try with me, despite their condition. You know, the pace was going to be set for 64.15 at halfway. I've asked for 63 flat, which is a new Oceania record by over a minute. And uh, that's a 2.06 finishing time. So that's uh, that's what I'm aiming for here. And, um, you know, the, um, I'm dead sure crossing halfway on Sunday I won't be alone. I'll be with one pacemaker, but a lot of Kenyans will be there still. So it's never over. And that oceanic record at the moment for the marathon rests with your brother, Jake. Um, it's actually still 207, and it's held by, um, is, it Nate, is it Deeks? Oh, is that right? My yeah. apologies. So, yeah, of yeah. course, the great... Uh, and Zane, you know, training in East Africa, 
what would you say are the top and you know we have with us today matt fox from sweat elite who has documented and featured as an interest edition with the show before about some of the training methods of the east africans what would you say zane uh, are the top two or three differences from training in the east east africa so to speak uh to the to the west new zealand your homeland i think the biggest differences are um easy days are easy we we run off time we don't run hard we really focus on okay if we have 80 minutes or 90 minute run we run on the time we don't even care gps doesn't work great in the forest even if we're not in the forest we just don't care about the how many kilometers you run that time it's about effort and it's about easy effort so you can't say oh every day is four minutes pace is easy you have to you have to feel your body because one day four minutes can be easy the next day six minutes can be easy mm-hmm. so i think um it's also a piece of advice for the people um that's the one difference i um, i can give mm-hmm. second um uh, has to be has to be diet I mean, over there, we don't even second-guess it because everything's organic, everything's nutritional that we eat. We don't have to fight to uh, avoid these temptations of eating crap. Mm. Um, I mean, it is there. Of course, you can go to the shop and buy it, but people just don't. Um, and the third third piece of advice is enough rest. You know, you, between the sessions... You have to you have to really rest. I mean, if you want to be the best, you can't work um, another job. You can't you can't rest enough. You, once you're finished training, you have to eat and then sleep or just do nothing. So the pacing, the diet, and the rest, and the rest always makes me think of. Often makes me think of Nick Willis, Steve Willis's brother, who's who's also in the building today. Nick once said, "You get ahead when you rest." Because come the start line at the major meets, everyone's done the work. Yeah, exactly. Um, when you rest is when the bo- when the body absorbs the training. Um, when you don't rest, you're just adding more on. And that was one of the big- biggest problems, biggest mistakes I've made in the past. I have been in better shape. I believe I've been in a 58 half marathon shape in my lifetime. I didn't see the result of that training because I just cooked the limit. And... Um, when that happens, you know, always I was training with a group of other athletes and I was focusing on attending every session rather than uh, what my body feels and when it feels like, okay, it needs to rest, it needs to miss this session because the the group's not going to wait for you, which is one thing I've changed this year and I've made... Um, a small group around myself so when I want to rest I can postpone the session for one or two days and come back and do it when I'm ready and Zane you know your learnings have evolved I mean the, the learnings that you now apply to manage your body are different from the ones that you know you didn't have when you were 17 that eager eyed young New Zealand boy heading over there uh, you've had Several bony stress injuries to date is, you know, you've shared the, the ankle injury, trauma, and then the sacral stress injuries, the metatarsal. Uh, what would be one bit of advice for people out there in terms of bone, you know, trying to manage bone injuries from your coming back from these injuries successfully? I, I think the, the mind plays such a huge part of it as well because there are some really dark days um, where you just have to... You just think that, oh, OK, uh, will I, well, after this, will I be OK, you know? Um, uh, will I be able to run the same? You know, you, you have to believe... You have to take small steps every day. You have to stay positive in some way. You have to keep the right people around you. And by that, I don't mean always asking about the injury. You have to almost forget about in the first part Mm. just do something else um if you can't run if you can't cross train let's say a sacral stress fracture is very difficult you have to do something else you have to go be with friends uh, 
and do other activities to keep you busy. And what were you doing off the back of your sacral stress injuries? Luckily, the second time it happened, I was able to travel to New Zealand. I was able to see physios. I was That really didn't help me a lot because nothing heals a bone quick enough. So only thing is rest for a, for a while. They can diagnose why it happened and give you some exercise for strengthening the uh, the other problems around it. And once that was done, I was like, "Get me the hell out of here! I want <laughs> I want to go and enjoy pizza, my friends, uh, the ocean, and other things." You know, so it's exactly what I did. And when I did leave New Zealand, I was very unfit, but I didn't care. I was going back to a place where I can run and become in shape very quickly. So once I was back in Africa, it was work time and my mind had even rested. So, And how did you then get back loading the bones, you know, the bone in this case, the sacrum safely and wisely where you're following a, you know, you've been there before. And this second injury, we should say, Zane, cost you your marathon debut at the Commonwealth Games in 2018 here on the Gold Coast. So... Uh, so you know there was a there's a fair loss of um, loss of what this injury cost you. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'd been planning that that one for a while, and I'd even done the heat preparation for it. I saw what happened to Callum Hawkins, and I knew that I'd prepared very well for that, so there wouldn't have been a problem. Uh, I feel like. No um, disrespect to Michael Shelley or any of the other athletes, but I feel like I would have been the gold medalist that day. And I feel like that's what it cost me, um, just by not having enough medical care and, um, and checkups in Kenya where I was training at the time. Um, I, I actually used that one for a bit of motivation on Sunday. Yeah, full circle. Yeah. Just over a year later and here you are. Yeah. Ready to roll. Uninjured. Uninjured. Successfully having returned to the running loads that you need to to post some of your, you know, off prior recording, you shared that some of your training sessions have been the best uh, that you've ever had. It was mirroring, if not better, than the form that you had in 2015 when you ran sub one hour for the half. Yeah. And to go back to your last question, because I don't think I answered it uh, well enough, but um, just to load, th- mm. going through the loading process, um, you have to start easily uh, with just one minute running, one minute on, one minute off, or one minute on, two minutes walk, and you you start with like five times, and then ten times, and you start with one day on, one day off, so it's it's a slow process, but after a month, you're you're up to maybe running five minutes times four or five, and very quickly after that you can run 30 minutes, 40 minutes without stopping. And then after two months you're away, completely away. So it is a process about two, three months of off, and then another one to two months of uh, rehabbing. But after that you can train fully. And for me, for someone like myself, it's taking about, I'd say, six weeks of foot down, and I can be in shape. I have a huge base. All the training I've done over the years, it's not gone. The body remembers it, and it knows how to get back to that place. It just takes a lot of, um, takes a lot of work. Listening to New Zealand National Marathon record holder Zane Robertson Olympian sharing around his highs, lows, and learnings of his career to date. Support for today's show comes from the Gold Coast Marathon. Just like the physical performance show, the Gold Coast Marathon encourages runners of all ages and abilities to push their boundaries and strive to complete a personal challenge. The Gold Coast Marathon is held annually on the first weekend in July and is a must-do event for any budding athlete, weekend warrior or family looking for a challenge to complete together. Run for the good times at the Gold Coast Marathon. Visit goldcoastmarathon.com.au. 
Support for today's show also comes from Pogo Physio. We exist to help you get back to your physical best following injury. We want everyone who walks through the doors of Pogo Physio to complete their rehabilitation get back to their physical best, and in doing so, cross their physio finish line. Our philosophy is that we do not want to see our patients for a single session more than what they need or a single session less. We simply want to ensure that we help you get back to your physical best to enjoy the things that you love to do. In addition to traditional session-to-session appointments, we also offer some industry-first and award-winning fixed-fee rehabilitation services, including our very popular monthly wellness boosters where from a low $195 a month you can receive in-room physiotherapy, exercise rehabilitation, remedial massage therapy and use of -of state-of-the-art equipment including the Alter-G anti-gravity treadmill. To find out more about Pogo Physio services or to schedule your one-hour initial appointment jump over to pogophysio.com.au. For now let's jump back with Zane Robertson, New Zealand Marathon national record holder sharing around his highs, lows, and the many learnings. And Zane, uh, you know, you've done it successfully, so well done, and you're entering a race, as you say, nervous, scared, but confident, confident that, you know, you're uninjured and you're ready to go and you've been posting good times, so it's going to be exciting. Zane, uh, we've inadvertently covered there's three themes of this show the highs the lows and the learnings we've spoken about some highs half marathon sub 60 uh is there not any other highs in your career that really stand out for you moments of yeah um one of the moments for me breakthrough moments is the commonwealth games in glasgow 2014 you know it was the first championship I mean that I I really got a medal in 2013 in Moscow my first world championships I made the final the heats I ran from the front with a few others I scraped into the final but I was still scared walking out to the track for the final I was nervous I was scared um uh a few months later I made the world indoor final my first uh, indoor championships ever my first indoor race ever ran from the front made the final and walking out to the final this time something was different I felt like okay today today you're going to medal you have a chance I gave it my all and something went wrong and I finished last and I learned a lot from that a few months later I walked out for the Commonwealth final and this time I'd learnt from being scared, being confident, making a mistake, and then um, I was finally ready and I delivered. But when I did finish, the the joy I felt um, just gives me goosebumps to this day. And going for a victory lap with my flag and um, remembering, you know, that this is the first time that the, uh, all the people back in New Zealand who doubted me, they can see me for the first time, you know, and I know they're all seeing me. And what was the show of support from back home like to you? I was immediate. It was amazing. Um, I before I was even on the bus uh, back to back to the, the village. I was getting media requests, so when I arrived back in the, the Commonwealth Village, I had some interviews immediately before I entered. There were TV, news, newspapers, um, and I was like, oh, wow, this is going to be a big deal, and of course it is. You know, for, a, for let's say, just a non-East African, because the East Africans dominate the 5,000 right now, and by no means were the Ugandan or the Kenyan teams weak there. They sent full full force teams at that time, and uh, I mean world world medalists potential. So to be a medalist there, it's like being a medalist at Worlds. So what a high! Ah, uh, exactly. So and you know, I mean, it makes me think. Uh, you know, seeing seeing you recount that story of Alex Hutchinson, who's perhaps one of the most prolific sports writers in running on the planet, author of bestseller Endure, and uh, in getting ready for today, I heard Alex 
talking about yourself and your brother Jake say that the fact that these guys have made it on such an unorthodox path is intriguing. Uh, And so, you know, the medals are a part of that success of making it. But along with that, as you've shared, there's very much been the lows. What would be the lowest day of your athletic career to date? The lowest day, the darkest day. Mm. There's been a few. So, one of the darkest days was actually, it was uh, just before Rio, when I realised... Uh, you alright? Yeah, I'm good. You're doing awesome, mate. Yeah, I'm good. You're, I'm sweet. You're the real deal, mate. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Impressive. No, the... Probably the injury before Commonwealth. It's pretty bad. Okay. Yeah. So one of the darkest days for me was um, the injury just before Commonwealth Games because after my medal in Glasgow, I really wanted to back up and even change the colour of that medal to being a gold one. And I'd worked very hard coming back from uh, my sacral stress fracture just over a year ago. And for it to happen again just three weeks out from the Games was um, so devastating and just such a, such a kick after all that's happened to me that um, it, it crosses your mind, like, is this the point of retirement? Is this the point where your body gives up on you? Is this, um, is this the end for me? And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's the point of depression, really. You have to you have to fight through that, and you have to get get away from wherever you are and do something that makes you happy. So, to get out of Africa to go back to New Zealand after the games, which I was watching on TV, seeing the race, watching live when um, Kellum was pushing on, and just seeing him faint there, I thought, wow, you know, this was that was going to be my day. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, you mentioned the word depression. Uh, Did you just feel, like, hopeless at that point? Yeah, because there's nothing more you can do, you know. Um, I don't have a lot of other things I do, so when when I lose running, I feel like I'm losing my life, you know. I'm, I'm in jail. I'm in prison in my own body, and... I'm just not a happy person anymore. I, I really try not to take it out on people around me, and they always say that really you shouldn't do that, but it, it, it happens. It's natural. Um, so you become you become a worse person when you're injured. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I always say uh, athletes can deal with the pain. They're used to pain. It's the frustrations, the fears, the anxieties, the, the psychological low points that come with injury. That's the hard stuff. Um, so it's very much in parallel with typical injury, you know, uh, psychological processing. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, to find someone to speak to, to understand you completely, um, it's very difficult, you know, um, I mean, yes, I'm married, I have a wife, and uh, she's understanding, but I think no one can ever understand me as well as, um, as an, on an athlete's point of view, as my brother, mm-hmm. because we've been through so much together. We know exactly the struggle we survived and um, how hard it was, you know, but... If both of us weren't there, we none of us would have made it. And the, you know, looking at you guys interact and what's available online, etc. There's such a strong supportive bond between you guys. If if it's your brother qualifying for world champs and you're not at that meet, say Stanford, then you're you know you're personally disappointed, but you're ecstatic for your brother. It's, it's a beautiful thing to observe. Yeah, definitely. There's there's no civil rivalry or anything like that anymore. Um, that was abolished before we left New Zealand. You know, we had to think the world is bigger than the 
two of us, the world is bigger than trying to be the best New Zealander. Um, you have to think outside your square. You have to think about the biggest possible target, and that's to be the best in the world. If you fall short of that, you still fall somewhere pretty good. And um, definitely um, the last two years I've spent just watching my brother run well, amazingly, has also been so, so awesome. I'm so happy that he's he's back where he should be. And at the same time, it's been devastating. It's been adding to a little bit of my frustration. And hopefully I can release some of that on Sunday. Zane, let's talk about the learnings, the learnings of your career to date. Before we do the performance round, I must ask you about your strength and conditioning. I've been impressed with some of the things I've observed you doing as part of your routine. Uh, you know, what are the things that you think are important about strength and conditioning? I mean, that's something that goes unsaid. I've been doing it since I left New Zealand and I've been learning from everyone along the way, anyone who comes through Kenya or Ethiopia, physios, coaches, uh, S&C coaches, um, just online seeing exercises. I'm at the point now where I have quite an understanding of correct technique and um, the principle of what each exercise is for. So I never abuse that. I never try to go, oh, endurance or more is better. I try to do it correctly. And just being in the gym sometimes frustrates me because I see other people doing it wrong, especially where I live in Ethiopia. They just think more is better and just mm. smash it out and keep going. But um, um, actually, the calf, since you gave me those calf wall sits, and if you guys want to check it out, go, go and check out Brad Beer's um, Instagram profile or, or my own. Um, actually, I've posted a photo there so you can see how the exercises are done. Um, I've completely recovered from my soleus, um, soleus issues and never felt better. Awesome. Yeah. And, uh, I was really encouraged to see you doing some really good uh, below the knee uh, it's a little phrase I like to use, below the knee is the key, uh, doing some of the you know, uh, energy storage work with your Achilles tendon in the gym. So kudos to you, Zane. Oh, definitely. Um, I believe the same. You know, tendons are such a, such an, a, an, like vital part of running, sprinting, distance running, anything, because you don't use your muscles alone. Um, it's tendons are stored energy and exercises like plyometrics or skipping um, can teach you to be quicker on the ground and you don't want to be light on the ground people get the idea that running light is um, you know the Africans are on their toes and they run lightly across the ground, that's not true yes we look like we're light but really we're thrashing the ground it's a plyometric activity for for 21 or 42 kilometers and we're hitting the ground with more body force and more body weight the more body weight you put into the ground the more return you'll get if you're using your body right and the tendons a vital part of that so I think to train it is, um, is a must You're listening to New Zealand distance running star, New Zealand marathon national record holder, Zane Robertson, sharing around his highs, lows, and career learnings to date. If you missed last week's episode, it was another featured performer episode, which put the spotlight on Australian Olympic champion from the 1984 Olympic Games, Glenis Nunn. Here's a little snippet of what you missed. There's coaches still saying, oh, no, you shouldn't do bounding, you shouldn't do hops. If you do it under a controlled you know, environment and you, you're led the right way and you don't do too many contacts, if you do it correctly, you land flat-footed so you're not putting all the pressure through the ball of the foot up the shin, so you're not going to create shin splints, all those sorts of things. If you start them off slowly and gradually build on that base, then you can make a really strong, robust body. To tune into the full episode and explore the archives of the physical performance, show dating right back to episode one 
featuring surf life-saving Ironman champion Ali Day. Jump over to pogophysio.com.au or simply peruse the archives from within your favourite podcast player. For now, let's jump back with Zane Robertson sharing on his career, highs, lows and the learnings. Zane, uh, well done. Performance round, rapid fire questions. Yeah. Training session, Zane Robertson, most dislikes. I don't dislike a training session. I like everything I do. I like everything. Probably the training session I would dislike is the one where I'm waking up feeling tired, really feeling unmotivated, and probably shouldn't have gone for. That's the training session I don't like. Uh, meaning shouldn't have gone for means probably higher chance of injury, higher chance of being sick afterwards, and just like vitally on that red line limit of um, overtraining. Training session you most love? I would say the 10 or 12 times 1K on and off. And the uh, So it's 1K on, 1K off? Yeah, at a fast, and then the recovery is a moderate continuous pre-race meal what fuels zane robertson on the start line pre-race and pre almost pre-training um every hard training i repeat the same as i would do before any major race because the the, everything starts in the stomach there's a lot of nerves there so if there's anything wrong in the stomach the body doesn't work rice and fish what sort of fish? Um, the go-to in Africa because it's safe is f- rice and canned tuna. Yeah. You can never go wrong with it. Um, it's very rare you'll get canned tuna if you cook it well enough. That will make you sick. And so, if you were racing in the morning, in the morning, how long before would you ingest? Um, it's the night before. Yeah. The morning, you can't eat enough. It's just a piece or two of bread. Yeah a bowl of porridge something very small maybe four hours before the race um training in africa can't eat a morning meal before i go for training maybe a piece of bread um some wind force energy gel um some carbohydrate drinks before but we wake up already we're leaving the house 4 a.m so you don't want to wake up 3 a.m to eat something zane who's the athlete you most admire and why? Uh, actually, could be racing him on Sunday. Um, the man, Bernard Legat. Um, since 2004 Olympics, you know, watching El Garouge and Bernard Legat kick it out in that 1500 meter final. I was a 1500 runner at the time, and just watching uh, that was such an inspiration to me. Um, as a as a kid trying to make it to that level. And um, I didn't, I couldn't believe that in a f- few years or a few years on, like down the line, I'd be racing with him in different races, five thousand world champs finals, and um, such events like this. But never, I thought the marathon. But <laughs> here we are. Who's the toughest competitor you've ever raced, and why? Well, the toughest competitor. I've ever raced is on the day any man on the day is the toughest and I have to still say the toughest was the day of the half marathon sub 60 the the guy I raced he's completely unknown and to this day that is the race of his life and was the race of mine because we went head to head and he'd never broken 60 but he was fueled by such confidence after 15k by how good he was feeling. He just made a move off the front and started pushing some fartlek and dropped everyone except me. But then he dropped me. I had to dig the deepest I've ever dug in my life to claw myself back to him and say, no, today I'm not going to lose. And I did. I got back to him. It was about a kilometre where I spent on my own before I, I could close the gap, and I did. And then we ran the last part of the race together before finally coming into the stadium where I realised, oh, well, 
I, I checked my watch for a second and I thought for sure we're going to run 60 until I, until I saw my watch and I, I knew that we're coming to the stadium there's about 150 metres to go we, we can run under 60 here I didn't know what the course record was but it, it just fueled my adrenaline and I kicked like I don't even know <laughs> but um, the only mistake I made was the last last 50 metres where I started I heard the crowd getting louder and I thought he's coming for me instead of thinking about there's the clock finish when you start thinking about he's coming for you you're done that's the hardest competitor I've faced to this day and that race finished up with that gentleman won you too uh, yeah, he passed me in the final stride, and there's just it's just one of those finishes where there's nothing you can do. You you have you're in the air, and he's passing you. And once your foot hits the ground, you've finished the race. And he just 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 put the foot down first. Zane, uh, mantra when you race. Is there a mantra that you use when you race? It's a pretty boring one, <laughs> but it's a pretty interesting one. I self-motivate before the race thinking about all the all the things that motivate me I go through the positives and negatives when I start I don't think about anything about except about what I'm doing being straight breathing oxygen and running as fi- as efficiently as I can I remember clearly on my long trainings but mostly in Marugami half where I ran so well it's like a metronome my my head just starts counting numbers it sounds boring but I just go through one up to a random number it could be 30 it could be 50 and I start again and I don't know why I started doing that but that's what happens and you counting your foot strikes it's kind of like I'm counting to my foot strikes, yeah. Yeah. It's not the first time I've heard of that metronomic counting. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> I thought I was mental, so <laughs> good <laughs> good to hear that. Saying so one word to describe your racing style, what would it be? Aggressive. And last questions in the performance zone here, Zane. How would you describe being in the zone? Spaced out. No, no words to describe it. Just completely in a in a space where it's almost like um, how I've been living, you know, through the weekdays. I, my wife gave me time alone through the week, so I just sit in the house alone, and I think that's quite vital for long distance events to be alone, to get used to being alone, because you spend a long time alone in your own head when you're in these races, and if you're not used to that you can lose yourself very quickly. So it's, it's, a, it's a place of focus, it's a place of peace, like I said, between negative and positive energy. And, um, yeah, you'll, you'll see it all up on my face on Sunday. Don't worry. <laughs> Zane, every guest of the Physical Performance Show issues listeners with a physical challenge for the week. What's Zane Robertson's physical challenge to listeners going to be? Well, um, seems I'm here with you, Brad. I'm going to give them uh, what you gave me, the wall sits, um, 45-second wall sits. Uh, we can start with two legs, 10-second uh, recoveries between. Um, it's called soleus wall sits, so if you need more information on how to do it, we can post another video of how to do it. Um, just come to either Brad's Instagram page physical performance page or um, my own and we'll share it there again later on today Zane if you could boil everything you've learnt through your athletic career to date and what a journey it's been in my mind one of the great stories of, uh, of the running world and you could boil it to one piece of advice what would it be to help listeners of this show perform at their own physical best I think no matter what distance you train for there is no magic mileage figure. There, everyone always asks me how many kilometres, how many miles do you run in a week. I tell them I don't know. I know a roundabout, but I don't care. 
It doesn't help you. I could probably run 500 or 1,000 kilometers in a week if I wanted to. Would it make me a better runner? No. So easy days go easy, hard days go hard. Learn to read your own body, not someone else's. The magic is not in a number. It's an effort. Finally, Zane, the most important thing in life is... Happiness. Be happy. Whatever you do, don't... You know, your path is your path, so you need to find what makes you happy. Um, no one can tell you, oh, that's not, un that's not conventional. You can't do things that way. It hasn't been done before. You, you have to go out and do it. It hasn't been done because no one's done it before. And um, just like Jake and I, it had never been done. Well, now it has, so it can be done. And you really have pioneered a move of training camps from other nations coming to training in East Africa. You've got other athletes that have sort of modelled what you, boy, you, you boys have done. I mean, since we moved out there, not, this place was um, honestly a village. It wasn't as it is now. And um, we have pioneered that. You know, since people started coming out, the government funding came in and um, the place really developed quite quickly into more of a small town than anything. But um, it was a real rural village when we got out there and we were some of the first white people they'd ever seen. Yeah. Zane Robertson, thank you for stopping by, sharing the highs, lows and learnings and... All the best for this marathon debut and, of course, beyond. Thanks for having me, Brad. Anytime. So there you have it, another episode of the Physical Performance Show. And I trust and I know that you enjoyed today's featured performer, Zane Robertson. What a story, what an athlete. Ahead of recording this episode, Zane and I connected online where I assisted Zane with some niggles that he was experiencing in the lead up to his 2019 marathon debut at the Gold Coast Marathon. We'd come straight out of a physiotherapy session when we sat down at Pogo Physio to record the interview that you just heard. Zane was wonderfully gracious with his time in the lead up to his marathon debut. So a massive thank you to Zane and Zane's team, Steve Willis. And also on the day, we had Matthew Fox from Sweat Elite in the room, capturing on video some of the session, which you can view over at the show notes, pogophysio.com.au. If you enjoyed today's episode and you want to learn more about the East African Kenyan training principles, then I do suggest you go back and listen to episode 136 featuring Sweat Elite founder, Matt Fox. Sweat Elite will also be shortly releasing Zane Robertson's training diary on their website. So keep an eye out for that. If you did enjoy today's episode or you took on the Soleus Wall Sit Physical Challenge, then do let Zane know what it was that you enjoyed or how you've gone with this week's physical challenge. You can find Zane over on Instagram at Zane underscore Robertson underscore NZL. Now that's Robertson, R-O-B-E-R-T-S-O-N. Keep the podsies coming. They are the screenshots of the episode that you're enjoying and tagging in the Physical Performance Show on Instagram at the Physical Performance Show. You're welcome to also tag me in at Brad underscore beer. I really enjoy seeing which episodes you're enjoying and what it is that you're up to while you're out and about enjoying the show. If you know someone who would enjoy Zane Robertson's sharings, then please feel free to share this episode with them. That would mean a lot. Thank you also to the show listeners who have been hitting subscribe. That really is the best way for the Physical Performance Show to reach more people just like yourself who are looking to pursue and perform at their own physical best. Of course, another huge thanks to those who have been leaving reviews over on iTunes. And this week, a massive thank you to a reviewer of the show, Marathon Bunny, over on iTunes, rating the show five stars and commenting, thank you for keeping me sane during my long runs whilst training for the Gold Coast Marathon with your fascinating guests and technical information. Before I knew it, my run was over and I've been learning so much. Marathon Bunny, thanks for taking the time to leave the review. Massive thanks always to the hardworking and great team behind the show, Daryl Misson on audio engineering, Susan Wilkin on all things show administration, and Matthew Walding on all things graphic design. 
At the time of recording, just off the back of the 2019 edition of the Gold Coast Marathon, a big shout out also to some of the show alumni. There are many to mention, including US American great Bernard Legat, Australian distance running stars Ben St. Lawrence, Liam Adams, Sinead Diver, and Lisa Waitman. If you missed the run-ins of the Gold Coast Marathon, in 2019, jump over to YouTube or Facebook and you can view the entire race with a great live stream, including commentary from previous show alumni Steve Monaghetti and Benita Willis. Finally, if you are into your running and as a show supporter, you are welcome to a 50% off the recommended retail price savings on You Can Run Pain-Free, my running bestseller, now in its second revised and expanded edition. It's packed full of five steps that'll help you, as the title says, enjoy injury-free and faster running. Jump over to pogophysio.com.au, visit the shop and enter the promo code POGO, P-O-G-O, 2019. Another huge thank you to this week's show sponsor and supporter, the Gold Coast Marathon. It is my favorite event. It's mid-year, and if you are looking for a great, challenging event on the beautiful Gold Coast, then look no further than the Gold Coast Marathon, held on the first weekend in July. And as the 2019 edition of the race showcased, it's an event simply not to be missed. So Gold Coast Marathon, thank you once again for your support of the Physical Performance Show. Now, coming up next week on the Physical Performance Show, we flip over to an expert edition. Next week's expert edition features Neil May. Neil May is a Gold Coast-based physiotherapist currently undertaking his PhD in all things kettlebell resistance training. So this is a deep dive into the world of kettlebell training. And it's for those who have looked at the kettlebell, those funny-shaped objects, perhaps been a little bit intimidated, but also intrigued as to how to better use a kettlebell or how to even use one in the first place. So don't miss next week's episode, an expert edition featuring PhD scholar and Doctorate of Physiotherapy, Neil May. Until then, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show. Listener.